Welcome back to the Star Trek Critic, where we rip apart the show as if we know more than the producers. Each episode starts with 100 points, then one point taken away for each error. Today's episode is Assignment Earth, the second season finale, and loses points before it even starts, since the Enterprise goes back in time to watch a backdoor pilot, which is a cheap way to test out a new series, which was done on the Brady Bunch, Happy Days, and even The Office. The next point is lost for having this the last episode of the season. Since Star Trek was cancelled and barely got renewed, the last episode should be for the crew, not other people. They did this in Enterprise too. Also, it makes the show look like the third season will be about Gary 7 instead, so it's a real F you to the Star Trek crew. The next point is lost for the time travel. They act like this is a routine trip, when in reality, in Trek reality that is, time travel is dangerous, not a perfect science and should only be done if absolutely necessary. It looks like Captain Archer never did tell them about the temporal cold war. When they traveled through time, did Kirk dream of whales? This is a great shot of Lieutenant Sulu. But wait, that's not Sulu on the left, so minus one more point. Look closely, Leslie's behind Sulu in a red shirt. 1968 may have also been the year the show aired, but that year did have a lot of difficulties. A lot like 2020. Kirk is talking about himself in the third person. Force shields isn't really correct terminology, but they'll say it different every once in a while. This is a rare shot of the scanner in the transporter room. You hardly ever see it. They get it to do the shaking ship dance one last time for the year. Lieutenant Uhura looks beautiful as ever. Looks like somebody left their jello cube on the transporter panel. Kirk sees how far he can lean without falling over. And it's very unusual to be hit by somebody else's transporter beam. Especially if he just went back in time 300 years. So something's wrong. Especially when it turns out to be a man with a snotty little cat. And since it's an alien transporter beam, it should be alien glitter, not their own. So minus one more point. You know something is wrong when a man with a cat beams in from a thousand light years away. And through their shields too. And again, Kirk is repeating the guest star's line. He's accusing them of being from the future. It's not like he's from the area either. Look closely, Isis is laying next to the steps of the transporter pad, but now she's in an unknown corner with carpet, so minus one point. Gary Seven tells where he came from and his history, but it's impossible for him to prove who he is. But Kirk really doesn't believe him, does he? Now they go into playground fighting. I am from this time period. No, you are not. This is going to go on for quite a while, I bet. Actually, Spock is responsible for the destruction of Romulus. Kirk really does have validation to be concerned. Spock tries to pinch him, while security just wants to play with the cat. The fact that the pinch didn't work makes it even more suspicious. Minus one more point for the captain's log talking down to the audience like we forgot what happened during the commercial break. Spock discovered he is a cat lover. Isis helps Spock discover who he is. Kirk calls for a staff meeting for all the information, and Chekhov says, We already told you everything we know. Now they're going to show off their fancy three-sided TV. Wait, that's Leslie in a gold shirt now, so minus one point. Now Leslie's in a red shirt in engineering, so minus one more point. He gets around way too quick. Here is Chekhov from one angle, and now from another. That's what she said. Spock is right about this. They were pretty accurate for the coup and the assassination, but shouldn't they also know the platform will explode? Or did they actually change history and their databanks instantly change? I don't think they changed history, which means they didn't know, so minus one point. Luckily, this hasn't happened yet, but it still could. Gary Seven is going to escape with the sonic screwdriver he stole from Doctor Who. It also releases a happy spray. And he likes the happy spray. Yeah. Of course, this makes Gary Seven's story more suspicious. Spock has to be logically annoying as usual. Minus one point for not showing exactly how he knew how to operate the transporter. Dr. Seven has now arrived in his New York City office. You gotta admit, he does have a nice office. Now we get to meet the smart mouse computer. I am a beta 5 computer capable of analytical decisions. So the new show will have Beta 5 and Dr. 7 bickering instead of McCoy and Spock. Of course, the computer already knows this. He's explaining this to the audience. So minus one point, he should have explained this to Kirk and Spock instead. Since there is no evidence he scrambled the computer, the transporter chase should remember where he beamed down. So minus one more point. Silly Spock, being there in orbit changes history. The other two agents were supposed to sabotage the missile, but didn't get the job done. 
This is cutting it close. In reality, both Dr. Seven and the Enterprise should have shown up a day earlier to watch this event. The next point is lost for the Captain and First Officer beaming down together. Here is proof the world is about to destroy itself. There is a man pushing a stroller. This is equality gone too far. No! Look at how disturbed she is. The sight of a man pushing a stroller is much more dangerous to the future of humanity than a nuclear missile platform. He has a microwave oven that can make fake IDs. Well, we have that now. And a printer that can make maps that look like the ones from the 1960s. The next point is lost for Terry Garr having a bad time on the set. I guess there was talk about Gene Roddenberry wanting her skirt to be super, super short. And there might have been more going on, so minus one point. Gary Seven should know what the two missing agents look like, so minus one more point for making this mistake. I mean, it took the magic typewriter act for him to figure that out. Of course, he could have asked her right off who she was, like you should when you see a stranger in your office, but he didn't, so minus one point. And the computer is very knowledgeable about her appearance. Is he flashing her? This is horrible. No, he's just showing her his fake ID, which she says is very groovy. Even in the 1960s, Humans raised on an alien planet talk to cats. After watching the end of the show, have you ever wondered what he's really doing in there? So instead of a parallel Earth story to save the budget, they are using today's Earth in a time travel episode to save the budget. How cheesy can you get? I mean, how much did the time travel cost just to save a little bit of money? It took a while for this supercomputer to find out the other two agents were killed in a car crash. Look closely, this is a real elevator. It has two sets of doors, not like the fake Turbolift set. Gary Seven uses his magic pen to escape while Roberta Lincoln has to deal with Kirk and Spock. In reality, while she is calling the police, Kirk should have grabbed the phone and not the girl. Cause now look what happened. Of course, he remembers to take the cat, but not the secret map to the base. When did Spock get his hat back on and switch places with Kirk? The reason Kirk is upset, there's all the wine glasses on the wall, but no wine. This is why Gary Seven was so upset. If they have a direct beam in sight to the base for such an important mission, there should be no reason the other two agents died in a car accident in Florida. So a minus one point for a bad plot device. Minus one more point for putting a food truck that close to a Saturn rocket. Back in New York, Kirk found the secret plans that Gary Seven left behind. Now for a quick, only in Star Trek, escape routine comedy sketch, which probably also breaks the Prime Directive. Charlie is the actor who played Finnegan last year on Shore Leave, so I'm sure Kirk enjoyed playing this Starfleet Academy stunt on him. If they're going to show a Mission Control Center, shouldn't this Star Trek actor be in there? Yes! This officer may not know how to wear a hat or a tie, but at least he noticed a man walking around with a cat in a secure area. If you look closer, his pocket is unbuttoned and his badge is misplaced. The security guard may have gotten a few happy shots before Gary Seven zapped him. This doesn't look like the Paramount backlot at all. It looks like a wall paneling is coming loose. I don't know what satellite camera Scotty is using, but he just showed three separate rockets on three separate launch pads, so minus one point. There is no way a car is going to go under a rocket less than an hour before it launches, so minus one more point. Two cars. No, it's only a half hour before launch. If the launch director is at the gantry and they are locking the elevator, how did they not see him get in? So, minus one more point. This looks just like the elevator on the old rocket jet ride at Disneyland. The timeline is a little fuzzy here on how long it's been since Gary Seven was here and when Kirk and Spock arrived. And how did no one notice a sleeping security guard during all that time? So, minus one point. Back on the Enterprise, Scotty is clearly a good hacker to see these camera angles. But this one is of a missile being moved to a launch pad, not a launch pad itself, so minus one more point. This intruder alert goes off for Kirk and Spock wandering around, but not for a guy with a cat on the side of the rocket. Roberta Lincoln never shows remorse over her employer's death, but now talks to little green boxes and discovers the magic pin on the desk. She's thinking, cool, that's where all the alcohol is to fill those wine glasses. <laughs> And she's like, one little drink wouldn't hurt. To attract a bigger female audience, the producers put in a shot of a lot of men's butts. There is no way a rocket would have such a flimsy cover on its side without even being bolted on, so minus one more point. With a wiring job like that, how could he make it worse? 
The next point is lost for two trespassers being taken to the Mission Control Center instead of security during a nuclear missile launch. What's up with that? How are all systems green and go when there is a guy up on the rocket with his hand in the wiring going meow? If Spock says the status board is good, they can launch. If Scotty can see Gary 7 by hacking the security cameras, why can't security see him? So minus one more point. Roberta and Scotty beam Gary 7 at the same time. Luckily he didn't get split in half. This is a PETA violation. That is not the correct way to hold a cat. Roberta Lincoln is saying, oh my gosh, since she has never seen a missile that big before. The next point is lost for a random captain's log talking down to the audience. And how is he recording it? She's catching on to him now. This is blasphemy, referring to the ship by a pronoun. Gary Seven goes to work. Roberta tries to call for the police, but the cat snitches on her, just like the cat in Harry Potter. It might be possible Isis is jealous of Roberta's looks. He's successful, and we're in trouble now. The alarm for intruders outside is the same for a missile off course. The Enterprise crew spots it quick and knows something is wrong. Chekhov says they need to go closer in orbit to destroy it. They must be really far out. This is an outrage. They're calling the missile an armed woman. Enterprise security and a Vulcan pinch couldn't knock him out, but her purse did. Gary Seven's interference disabled their self-destruct, so they're screwed. Spock pinches security and saves the day. That's because you just pinched him. Just when he's trying to explain it all, Kirk and Spock show up. The next point is lost since they never tried to vaporize the missile from space. One phaser shot would have done it. Shout out to the set designers, these are not English characters. Gary Seven and Kirk argue again. Roberta saves the whole thing by almost killing Kirk. Spock looks like he's playing a fancy organ. Then he admits logic won't work in this situation and Kirk will have to rely on human intuition. Gary Seven destroys the missile and the world is saved. The magic typewriter records all the history that was made today. Roberta smiles. She still doesn't seem to notice that her bosses were killed in a car accident. Look closely, there's an ashtray in the corner. Some time must have passed since Kirk and Spock are back in their regular uniforms. Now we're going to end the show with a real cat fight. Yes! But unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen this episode. Aww. Now they know everything about Gary Seven and Roberta Lincoln's adventures and can't wait to watch them next year while secretly praying that the third season of Star Trek isn't these two replacing them completely because that would really suck. Plus, these two saying goodbye could be seen as them passing the torch. And this is the last time they will say energize and you will never see them again. While on season three of Star Trek, you will see these two instead. So who are these alien agents on assignment Earth? Three cats played Isis, but the voice was Barbara Badcock, who is also the voice of Trelane's mother. And next year we will see her on Star Trek in person. Ted Gearing was the policeman with 175 screen credits to his name, including MASH, the original Battlestar Galactica, and Super Train. Yeah! Bruce Mars played Charlie. This is his third and final appearance in Star Trek, better known as Finnegan from Shore Leave. He also appeared on Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, made it to the Olympic Trials in 1954, then joined the Self-Realization Fellowship, where he is a monk now known as Brother Paramananda. Morgan Jones was the Colonel, with 130 screen credits, including the Blue Angels and the Secrets of Isis. Don Kiefer has 180 screen credits. His last big appearance was on Liar Liar. Terry Gar was Roberta Lincoln, with 150 screen credits, including Young Frankenstein, Oh God, Close Encounters, and Tootsie. Unfortunately, she did get struck with multiple sclerosis, but continues working and is a speaker for several MS programs. Robert Lansing was Gary Seven. He spent two years in Japan with the Army, with 90 screen credits, including The Man Who Never Was and Auto Man. Unfortunately, Assignment Earth did not take off as many good backdoor pilots do, which is sad since even Joni and Chachi got a show of their own. But there are Assignment Earth comic books and many adaptations in the novels. Don't you worry about Gary Seven. He'll be back in a way you never thought possible. Assignment Earth, the season finale, gets a score of 79%. Yeah! So, what happened in season 2? We saw a Vulcan mating dance, the crew killed a former god, they met a hybrid monster probe, Spot grew a beard, they fought Val, they killed a giant planet eater, 
They had a Star Trek Halloween, Harry Mudd, Zephram Cochran's girlfriend. They hosted a diplomatic mess. McCoy delivered a baby. The crew got old and cranky. They were attacked by a killer cloud. Jack the Ripper. They discovered Tribbles. They were abducted by brains in jars. They became gangsters. Saw a monster amoeba. Had a private little war. Met godlike glowing balls. Fought Nazis. The crew turned into sugar cubes. And alternate Earth-China conflict. M5 tried to be Hal. They fought Romans and went back in time. These are the three episodes this season that should not be missed. And these three you could skip if you wanted to. That's all for now. Thanks for viewing. Be sure to join us again for the third season. And be sure to check out my other videos and playlists. And click that like button, the share button, and that subscribe button. And I'll see you again soon.